Hey guys, so I know it's been a while since I've uploaded a video, um, so I'm not going to delay for too long talking about why I haven't uploaded videos, uh, I'm just going to get right into the topic of today's video. Originally in my cryptology series, uh, we were going to talk about different types of ciphers in each video, like one video for each particular type of cipher, and then go into how to break the cipher and uh, that sort of thing, but I've decided not to do it that way because I'm having a hard time breaking them up into distinct chunks because ciphers are sort of interrelated and the process of cracking ciphers is sort of an interconnected feel. Because, for example, you don't crack one cipher just by learning to crack that one cipher. You have to first be able to recognize that kind of cipher and how it differs from other ciphers. So we're going to start with broader terms. We're going to talk about the difference between monoalphabetic and polyalphabetic ciphers. A monoalphabetic cipher is a cipher in which every letter of ci uh, plain text gets converted to a letter of cipher text, and it's always the same letter of cipher text. That means that if A gets turned into F, then all A's in the message get turned into F's. So now F represents A. This is not good security, and the reason for that is because it doesn't take a lot of analysis to be able to figure out, you know, analyze patterns and figure out what uh, the different characters in the ciphertext represent. In fact, it's so simple that it doesn't even matter if you're using English letters anymore. If your message is in English and then you convert each, um, each letter to a random arbitrary scribble, as long as that scribble always represents that particular letter. So if I create a circle that represents A, then I always use a circle for A's in the message it's as easy for me to crack as it would have been had it been replaced with a, a, a real letter, so A getting turned into E, for example. It's just as easy. Uh, it doesn't provide a lot of security, uh, and there's many different ways to identify whether the cipher is monoalphabetic or polyalphabetic. Some examples of monoalphabetic ciphers, the Caesar shift, the at-bash cipher, which is where uh, you basically mirror the first half of the alphabet and the second half of the alphabet, so A becomes Z. Uh, B becomes Y, C becomes X, and you know so on to the middle of the alphabet. So those are some monoalphabetic substitution ciphers. A polyalphabetic cipher, on the other hand, offers much more security. This one works by using a system that causes letters in the in the plain text to be converted to one of a possible set of letters in the cipher text. So A isn't always going to be turned into D, for example. Sometimes it might be D, sometimes it might be J, sometimes it might be M. It really uh, depends on how you're encrypting the message. This offers much more security because unlike with a uh, simple substitution cipher, you can't look at the text and say, my camera just fell, you can't look at the text and say, uh, well, this letter here is an A, so this letter represents A throughout the rest of the message. I now know all the A's in the message. Polyalphabetic cipher works by shifting, uh, not shifting, but transposing letters to uh, other characters in the uh, cipher text and not always the same character. An example would be the Visionaire cipher. The Visionaire, the way it works is you take a keyword such as, let's say, bacon, uh, and then you shift each letter in the text over by the number that corresponds to the letter in the keyword. So, it, your first letter gets shifted over 2 because B is the second letter of the alphabet, so 2. The next letter gets shifted over 1 because A, the next letter in your keyword, in bacon, is uh, you know, it has a numerical value of 1 in the alphabet. And then C is 3, so your next letter gets shifted over 3. What this has the effect of doing is you basically just shift it over, you know, by the value, numerical values of B, A, C, O, N, B, A, C, O, N, until you reach the end of the message. And so sometimes a letter might be shifted over by the value of B, which is 2. Sometimes it might be shifted over the value of C, which is 3. Sometimes it might be shifted over by the value of O or the value of N. The, the point is that it keeps changing. So that's why it's more secure. Now, it can still be broken, and I'll probably go into breaking the Visionaire cipher in a future video, I want to give one video to that cipher because it's a common polyalphabetic substitution cipher with an interesting method for uh, cracking. So, um, 
breaking uh, a cipher begins with identifying whether you're dealing with a polyalphabetic or a monoalphabetic cipher. The best way to go about doing this, in my opinion and my experience, is using frequency analysis. Now what this is, let me demonstrate something. This here is a graph of the frequency distribution of letters in the English language. As you can see, E is particularly uh, prominent. Um, it is a very common letter, the most common letter in English. You'll notice that all the vowels pretty much have uh, noticeable spikes because they are uh, used so frequently. Uh, and you'll notice that there are a lot of very uncommon letters such as Z uh, and then a lot of relatively common letters. But you'll notice, the main thing I want you to notice here is that there is a distinct chunkiness to this graph. It's not very smooth at all. You've got lots of peaks and lots of troughs. There's, it's very uneven. That is the frequency distribution of letters in English. So, if you run a piece of English text through a frequency analyzer, you should get very similar results. This is what happened when I took some random English words using a random text generator and put them through a frequency analyzer. The red bars are the text that I analyzed, the blue bars are the average frequency analysis of English. You'll notice that they're very similar all the way across. Now, why is this useful? Well, whenever you run a monoalphabetic substitution cipher through uh, a frequency analyzer, you're going to notice a very similar distribution because the letters are being transposed to are being transposed to only only one particular cipher text letter at a given moment. So, if E is the most common letter in your message and you replace it with M's, well, now all you've done is make it so that M is the most common letter in your mes in your message but it will still look similar on the graph. Whenever you show the graph, uh, this is what happened when I ran that same English text through uh, a Caesar shift. You'll notice that all we've done, we still have a chunky looking graph. All we've done is move over all the bars a certain distance. And so this tells us that this is a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. In fact, if we wanted to take the time, you'd notice that the similarity between the E and the and, uh whichever letter it is that I switched it with, you'll notice basically that it just looks like the bars have moved over. That's really all that all that has happened. Uh, so that even tells us that it's a Caesar shift. Now, what would happen if we ran a polyalphabetic substitution cipher through a frequency analyzer? Well, it would look something like this. The red bars represent the uh, frequency uh, of letters in the message which is a polyalphabetic substitution cipher of the same English text I used earlier, and the blue bars represent the average distribution of letters in English. Notice how much chunkier the English letters graph is to our cipher text graph. It's much smoother. And the reason for this is because if E is the most common letter in the English language, and sometimes it gets shifted over two spaces, sometimes it gets shifted over ten spaces, sometimes it gets shifted over five spaces, that means that E has that one bar for E has been broken up amongst several other letters. And so we've sort of smoothed out the whole graph. So if you're if what you're looking at has a distinct uh, distinct uh, smoothness to it compared to English letter distribution, then what you've got is a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. And so once you get that phase of the process done, uh, now it's just a matter of figuring out which cipher is being used, and there's mul numerous ways to do that. Trial and error is one of them. Uh, so is learning about as many different types of ciphers as you can, because it's a lot easier to recognize a particular, t a p a particular type of cipher if you already know that type of cipher. So, if you're looking at a visionaire cipher, um, Really, this depends on the type of cipher, because a visionaire cipher won't necessarily look hugely different from another substitution cipher. Take take the Playfair cipher, for example. The Playfair cipher uses letters in pairs uh, in order to encrypt them um, correctly. So, if the text that you're using, the, the, if the cipher text that you end up with has an odd number of letters, then it's not a Playfair because you need pairs of letters in order to encrypt with a Playfair cipher. In fact, with a Playfair cipher, uh, at the end of the message, if you've run, if you have an odd number of letters, so you get to the last pair and you've only got one letter, you put an X onto the end and then you encrypt those two letters. 
Um, and then whenever the person decrypts it, they'll know that the X at the end is not necessary. It's just there so that you have a pair of letters because you need a pair of letters to use a Playfair cipher. So odd number of letters, it's not a Playfair. That's the kind of thing that, you, that really just comes from experience, just knowing different types of ciphers. And I hope to be able to go into some more types of ciphers and cracking ciphers in, that, in a future video. I'd like to cut this one off right where it is though because it's gone on for about 12 minutes. Um, so yeah, um, that's all I can think of uh, for the differences between monoalphabetic and polyalphabetic substitution ciphers. Uh, thanks a lot for watching this video. I hope to be able to upload more videos um, soon. I keep getting busy. Uh, eventually I get to it, but usually it's a month or two after I've uploaded a video. I'd hope to be able to do it more frequently than that. Um, go check out Practical Deductions channel, his link is uh, in the description for this video. He's been uploading videos and he's got some pretty good stuff up right now. Uh, and he's much better at maintaining an upload schedule than I am. Uh, so thanks for watching, I hope this video has been helpful, uh, and I'd love to go into more codes videos in the future. Um, again, thank you very much for watching, I will see you next time.